theistic evolution critique, science needs philosophy. We've been studying the book Theistic Evolution, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique. Uh, the editors, the, you'll notice one of them is J.P. Moreland, and uh, today's chapter will be by him. First, I will point out that this book has a very specific aim. If you are dividing the way people look at origins into groups, you can have what I would call young life creationism, because young life but old earth belongs in this category. At least in my opinion, there's what is commonly known as old earth, but what should probably be called old life creationism. Um, there is um, theistic evolution that is ID friendly, and uh, in two weeks we're going to have that line very precisely drawn. And then there is theistic evolution that is not intelligent design friendly. And the way that th this is done um, the, the difference, just very briefly, is can you tell by looking at uh, the world around you or is everything exactly the way atheism would presume, which is, of course, the last alternative. The book, as the title implies, really doesn't primarily aim at atheistic evolution, although, of course, uh, atheistic evolution takes its lumps. Um, it's precisely aimed at the theistic evolution that you cannot tell that God is involved. In other words, we believe that by faith. There's no real evidence. And um, I don't like that definition of faith, but that's the way it's often used. Uh, this chapter, again, is by J.P. Moreland, and it is in section two. This is the beginning of section two, the philosophical critique of theistic evolution. Why Science Needs Philosophy is the title of this uh, uh, chapter, which is intended to be a, uh, an introduction to the rest of the chapter. The summary of the uh, chapter starts, We shall explore two philosophical theses from philosopher George Beeler that illuminate ways in which philosophy is relevant to science, especially to the debate about theistic evolution versus intelligent design. Number one, the autonomy of philosophy. Among the central questions of philosophy that can be answered by one standard theoretical means or another, most can in principle be answered by philosophical investigation and argument without relying substantively on the sciences. We don't need science for many questions and some important ones. The second point he wants to make is that the authority of philosophy, insofar as science and philosophy purport to answer the same central philosophical questions, in most cases the support that science could in principle provide for those answers is not as strong as that which philosophy could in principle provide for its answers. So should there be conflicts, the authority of philosophy in most cases can be greater in principle. And He's quoting, and we're going to run into those two in just a little bit. <clears throat> the autonomy of philosophy refers to areas outside of uh, areas of philosophical investigation that lie completely outside the competence of science. The authority of philosophy refers to areas in which both science and philosophy investigate, where the philosophical factors carry more weight than and trump those of science. I list key examples of both that are relevant to setting the intellectual context for debating the relative merits of theistic evolution versus intelligent design. Um, I will comment on that later. Uh, I have a little trouble with, a, 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 uh, with the authority of philosophy in particular, but we'll get to that later. Now, we're going to start the chapter itself. People sometimes ask, what does Athens, reason, have to do with Jerusalem, a meaning faith? The implied answer is usually nothing. In my correct view, the answer is plenty. Correct answer is plenty. But I cannot defend that claim here. Similarly, many people, especially many, maybe most, scientists ask, what does philosophy, idle speculation, have to do with science, which secures hard facts about reality? Again, the usual answer is nothing. 
But nothing could be further from the truth. Science and philosophy have interacted and do interact with each other in a number of ways that in the normal course of science education and practice are sadly not made available to scientists themselves. In this introduction to section two, the philosophical critique of theistic evolution, I shall focus on two philosophical theses that illuminate ways in which philosophy is relevant to science, especially to the debate about theistic evolution versus intelligent design. Here are the two theses stated clearly by philosopher George Beeler. And um, those are verbatim from before, so uh, we'll not read them again. And the reference is given in reference one. To illustrate briefly, the autonomy of philosophy refers to areas of philosophical investigation, that is, debates about abstract objects, different interpretations of modal logic, the relative merits of utilitarian versus virtue ethics, that lie completely outside the competence of science. The authority of philosophy refers to areas in which both science and philosophy investigate. For example, the nature of time, the question of whether unobservable theoretical entities of scientific theories exist or are useful fictions, which uh, is an important point we'll come back to later, where the philosophical factors carry more weight than and trump those of science. In what follows, I shall list key examples of both that are relevant to setting the intellectual context for debating the relative merits of theistic evolution versus intelligent design. Remember, that's precisely that question of can you tell that God did it? <clears throat> well, to be precise, intelligent design does not necessarily call, say that God did it, but most intelligent design people are, in fact, believers in the divine starting with the principle of authority. Examples of the principle of authority. Example one, Stephen Hawking on the beginning of the universe. In the past few decades, there has been a stunning revival of an argument for God's existence from the fact that the universe had a beginning. The argument, called the Kalam cosmological argument, is in fact many centuries old, but it has been given new strength and clarity in recent times. For our purposes, there are four arguments for the universe as having a beginning. The impossibility of an actual infinite set of concrete entities such as events. The impossibility of traversing an actual infinite series of events by successive addition. The standard Big Bang model and the second law of thermodynamics. Most of those who say that the universe did, not, did have a beginning hold the first two philosophical arguments to carry more weight than the last two scientific arguments. And thus, on the assumption that arguments for and against this claim are themselves philosophical, this seems to be a clear example of the authority's thesis that philosophy carries more weight than science. In his book, A Brief History of Time, Hawking develops a no-boundary model of the beginning of the universe. And he uses imaginary time, multiples of the square root of minus one, to avoid a cosmological singularity or an absolute beginning, to retain a finite past and to depict the initial segment of space-time as rounded off very much like the South Pole being the beginning of the Earth and various circles of latitude playing the role of time itself. Just as you cannot ask what is south of the South Pole, you cannot ask what was before the rounded off section of the initial segment of space-time. So there is no need for a beginning, yet the past is finite. Now, if you're going, what? Uh, you're in good company. Uh, philosophers, especially philosophers of science, have responded to Hawking in two ways. First, the philosophical support for the Kalam cosmological argument's first premise, the universe had a beginning, is stronger than the support for Hawking's model, so one should still believe in a beginning. Second, because Hawking's model employs imaginary time, a notion that is literally conceptually unintelligible, if taken to depict reality as it really is, the model should be understood in an anti-realist, that is, a, a, for example, an instrumentalist or positive way, positivist way, as a, a useful fiction, rather than a, a realist way, as an actual depiction of the real world. But of course, if you interpret science that way, then the whole point of what Hawking says disappears. 
Hawking admits that his model is nothing but a useful fiction and that he himself is an anti-realist, a positivist, and an instrumentalist. But these notions are not scientific ones and in fact cannot be found in purely scientific writings. I mean, how would you empirically test those concepts? Thus, for Hawking to know the meaning of these notions and explicitly identify his views with them, he had to do some reading in the philosophy of science, or at least some thinking in the philosophy of science. Why? Because these viewpoints and labels are philosophical in nature, and the field that has developed and debated them is philosophy, not science. So in order for Hawking to express the real implications of his model, he had to turn to philosophy, not to science. As a result, this nicely illustrates the authority of philosophy. This is an odd result since Hawking claims that philosophy is dead, and yet he must turn to philosophy in a foundational way to express how he understands his own model. And Hawking has said that philosophy is dead. Thus, it was the discipline of philosophy that both placed Hawking's model in the classification to which it belongs and continued to show that his model did nothing whatsoever to undermine belief in the universe's beginning. Certainly not in real time as opposed to imaginary time. Example two, Stephen Hawking's on the universe coming to be from nothing. In the grand design, Hawking and his co-author Leonard Mladeno claim that quantum physics has made the need for a creator and designer superfluous. This is because the universe can create itself, that is, it came into existence out of nothing. This claim upset the faith of a number of believers because it was the considered judgment of a scientist, indeed one of the top living scientists. But alas, Hawking and Mladenau may, be, may well be great scientists, but they're very poor philosophers. Why? Because their concept of nothing is not the same as the philosophical one, and the philosophical notion is the relevant one in deciding on the need for a creator. For Hawking and Mladenau, nothing means a quantum vacuum, which contains energy and is itself located in space. The universe comes into being spontaneously as a fluctuation of the energy in the vacuum. Uh, which vacuum? Uh, uh, unfortunately, this is hardly a case of a universe coming into being from nothing. That The philosophical notion of nothing is just that, the complete and total lack of any being whatsoever, including the absence of particles, causal powers, fields, properties, and so on, including the vacuum field, by the way. Given this notion of nothing, it becomes self-evident that necessarily something cannot come from nothing without a cause because there's nothing to come from. In this example, the philosophical considerations carry more weight than do the scientific claims. Example three, the origin of life. There's been a long-running debate as to whether or not we can discover a reasonable, natural, scientific explanation for the origin of life without the need for divine intervention or even the discovery of characteristics of life that are best explained by an intelligent designer. And that debate has, for quite some time, centered on scientific considerations. For example, the high improbability of chance and natural law doing the job. But some philosophers have resisted the notion of a purely naturalistic, physicalistic account of life's origins. To begin with, it has been very difficult for biologists to define life. As origin of life researcher Antonio Lascano notes, life is like music. You can describe it, but not define it. According to Fazali Rana, who's a uh, sidekick of uh, uh, Hugh Ross, uh, biologists have collected a list of around 100 different definitions of life. We've been through this before once. According to biologists, some of the essential characteristics of life include biological stability, permanence, and coherence, being made of atoms, molecules, and cells that obey the laws of chemistry and physics, being composed of a highly structured homeostatic nature, being able to ingest nutrition, expel waste, and reproduce. And notice that those none of those uh, have to do with uh, complex order. Uh, but scientific or biological attempts to define or provide essential characteristics of life flounder because, as many philosophers have pointed out, life is a univocal projectable predicate. What does this mean? First, the term life is something we pre predicate of certain things and not others. Second, life is univocal and not equivocal. That means it, that is, it means the same thing whenever we employ it. 
I would have a problem with that one, actually, and we're going to see why in a minute. Um, thus, to say a dog or a human or a fish is alive is to use the term life in the same way. Different living things may live in different ways and sustain their lives by employing different factors, but they are all living. We don't have one definition of life for a dog and another for a human and, another for a fi and one for a fish. If we did, life would be an unwieldy predicate of, uh, of which we would have no understanding when we applied it to a newly discovered creature. It's a lie. What does that mean? Finally, life is projectable. While we start out by using the term life for living things with which we are acquainted, we can also use the term for yet to be discovered actual or possible living things. For example, life in outer space or unicorns. But now a problem arises for biological attempts to define or essentially characterize life. Life is univocally predicable of disembodied souls after death, of angels and of God himself. And this is one of the places where I get lost a little bit. Uh, even if none of these things exist, their existence, I'm not sure how that follows there, their existence is coherent and intelligible. I guess that means the possibility of their existence. And the projection of life into possibly living things should be univocal. But none of these entities satisfy physical or biological characteristics for life. Thus, life itself cannot be physical, so the argument goes, and there will never be a strictly scientific account of life or its origin. To get life from rearranging matter is to get something, life which is not physical, from nothing, brute matter that does not have life. Interestingly, many philosophers have provided new evidence for this argument by claiming, following biologists, that living things are constituted by information. But apart from a few exceptions, Many, perhaps most philosophers who work in this area, have claimed that information is immaterial, um, more fundamental to reality than matter, and given its nature, there can be no material explanation for the origin of immaterial information, and thus for the origin of life. And there is a certain logic to that. Examples of the principle of autonomy, that is, science, uh, or philosophy does not need science to answer some questions. The nature and existence of consciousness and the soul. I doubt that any list of the proper issues within a sub-branch of philosophy would be complete. Still, it is possible to provide a reasonably adequate characterization of the central first order topics that are ubiquitous in the literature of philosophy in philosophy of mind. Those topics tend to revolve around four interrelated families of issues constituted by the following kinds of representative questions. Ontological questions. To what is a mental or physical property identical? To what is a mental or physical event identical? To what is the owner of mental properties or events identical? What is a human person? How are mental properties related to mental events? That is, for example, do the latter exemplify or realize the former? Are there Aristotelian or Leibnizian essences? And if so, what is the essence of a mental event or of a human person? Epistemological questions. How do we come to have knowledge or justified belief about other minds and about our own minds? Is there a proper epistemic order to first-person knowledge? I know because I'm experiencing it. And, um, of one's own mind and third-person knowledge of other minds. Which one comes first? That is, does the information we gain from our own first person's perspective about our own conscious states and our own self have rational authority over third person attempts by others to gain such knowledge, or is it the other way around? How reliable is first person introspection, and what is its nature? For example, is it an experiential seeming or disposition to believe? If the former, then the experience of one's mental state, for example, an awareness of the hurtfulness of a pain, is prior to the tendency to believe that a pain hurts. In this case, one has to admit that experiential states of consciousness, seeming states, are real and cannot be reduced to a belief, which can be reduced further to linguistic behavior, for example, the ability to use the pain, word pain correctly, an ability that an unconscious computer could uh, possess. If first-person introspection is reliable, should it be limited to providing knowledge of consciousness, or should it also include knowledge about one's own ego? Why worry about such issues? 
The answer is this. When we are trying to gain authoritative knowledge about consciousness, if the first-person perspective is of primary importance, then one will take consciousness to be what one experiences in introspection, and this supports the non-physical nature of consciousness. However, if one takes the third-person perspective to have priority, then scientific claims about the brain will have more authority than introspective claims offered from the first-person point of view, and this pecking order will support physicalist reductions of consciousness to brain states. Of course, what about the first-person consciousness of the scientist who is doing the third-person investigation of some other brain? Uh, Semantic questions. What is a meaning? What is a linguistic entity? And how is it related to a meaning? Is thought reproducible, reducible to or a necessary condition for language use? How do the terms in our common sense psychological vocabulary get their meaning? The main second order topics in philosophy of mind revolve around a fourth set of representative questions. Methodological questions. How should one proceed in analyzing and resolving the first order issues that constitute the philosophy of mind? What is the proper order between philosophy and science? Should we adopt some form of philosophical naturalism, set aside so-called final first philosophy, and engage topics in philosophy of mind within a framework of our empirically best attested theories relative to these topics? What is the role of thought experiments in philosophy of mind, and how does the first-person point of view factor into generating the materials for formulating these, those thought experiments. Obviously, a lot of questions. These are the sort of questions that form the warp and woof of philosophy of mind. Please lead, read the list carefully. It becomes evident that these are in no way scientific questions. They are philosophical to the core and nicely illustrate the autonomy thesis. How are you going to test between those answer, the answers to those questions by doing scientific experiments? But you may respond, as Nancy Murphy has, science has provided a massive amount of evidence suggesting that we need not postulate the existence of an entity such as the soul or mind in order to explain life and, and consciousness. I would disagree with Nancy Murphy, but whatever. This evidence consists of the fact that biology, neuroscience, and cognitive science have provided accounts of the dependence on physical processes of specific faculties once attributed to the soul. I offer two responses. The first stated nicely by Steve Evans regarding the findings of localization studies. That is, you put a probe in the brain, you stimulate it, and uh, something comes out. A memory comes back. Uh, you see red, whatever. Um, what exactly is it about these findings that are supposed to create problems for dualism? Is it a problem that the causal effects should be the product of specific regions of the brain? Why should the fact that the source of the effects are localized regions of the brain rather than the brain as a whole be a problem for the dualist? It is hard for me to see why dualism should be thought of, uh, thought to entail that the causal dependence of the mind on the brain should only stem from holistic states of the brain rather than more localized happenings. Second, all neuroscience can do is establish precise brute correlations, causal relations, or dependency relations between mental and physical states. It can tell us nothing about the intrinsic nature of consciousness or whether or not there is a soul. These are philosophical questions. To see this, consider the discovery that if one's mirror neurons are damaged, then one cannot feel empathy for another. How are we to explain this? Three empirically equivalent solutions, in other words, they can't be tested scientifically against each other, Solutions consistent with all and only the same set of observations come to mind. One, strict physicalism, a feeling of empathy is identical to the firing of mirror neurons. Two, mere property dualism, a feeling of empathy is an irreducible state of consciousness in the brain whose obtaining depends on the firing of the mirror neurons, but the feeling itself is not the same as the firing. And three, substance dualism, a feeling of empathy is an irreducible state of consciousness in the soul whose obtaining depends, while embodied, on the firing of mirror neurons. No empirical datum can pick out which of these three is correct, nor does an appeal to epi epistemic simplicity help. 
epistemic simplicity is a tiebreaker, and the substance dualist will insist that the arguments and evidence for substance dualism are better than those for the other t two options mentioned above. Example two, methodological naturalism, agent causation, and the nature of science. When it comes to the task of defining or de giving the essential characteristics of science, that task belongs to philosophers and historians of science and not to the scientists themselves. Perhaps the main philosophical issue in the theistic evolution intelligent design dialogue involves the appropriateness of using science to warrant the inference uh, to an intelligent cause for some phenomenon. Central to this dialogue is the question of whether or not science must adopt methodological naturalism, which is why we're going to see two more chapters on that subject. Roughly the idea that while doing science, one must seek only natural causes or explanations for scientific data. There has been some controversy as to which field is the proper place to turn to in order to seek professional expertise in resolving this debate. Nor is the question of professional expertise merely an academic matter of turf protection because currently it is largely scientists and science educators who are the gatekeepers for the public schools in this area. That there is a controversy can be seen from this statement by J.W. Haas, Jr., f former editor of the influential Perspectives on Science and Christian Faith. The place of the philosopher in the practice of science has long been controversial. Whether philosophers should, maybe can, be the arbiters of what constitutes science remains problematic for the working scientist. Along similar lines, scientist uh, Carl Giberson uh, rejects the traditional viewpoint that practicing scientists find so annoying Namely, that philosophers are the relevant, competent, and final authorities to determine the rules of science. Actually, the issue here is not controversial at all, since the central topics do not re uh, involve how to practice science, which requires familiarity with instrumentation, procedures, etc., <coughs> but <coughs> how to define science and distinguish it from non-science non or pseudoscience. To understand this debate and the proper field of study for resolving it, we must first make a distinction between a first and a second order issue. First order issue is a topic of science about some phenomenon. For example, how to, pre how to predict earthquakes or manipulate chemical reaction rates. A second order issue is a topic of philosophy about science itself. That is, its methods, its nature, its difference from other fields. Now, the question of how to define science is clearly a topic for philosophers and historians of science. Um, this is not to say that scientists and others cannot be a part of this discussion. It is merely to affirm that when they participate, they will be largely dealing with philosophical issues for which they are not professionally trained. I'm not sure that professionally has much to do with it, but, uh, but certainly one has to pay attention to certain issues. The fact that these issues are philosophical and not primarily scientific can be seen from the following. Read the relevant debates and discussions and ask what scientific experiment, what scientific procedure one would use to resolve the dispute about the nature, proper definition, and limits of science. Or get any college catalog and look at the course descriptions in the different branches of science. You will discover that almost nowhere in an undergraduate or graduate program even, in any branch of science are the relevant topics discussed, except perhaps in the first week of freshman chemistry. By contrast, entire graduate study programs in the history of philosophy of science are devoted to definitions of science and to drawing lines of demarcation between science and other fields. In other words, they work with the problem more. You'd expect them to know more. What is the relevance of the authority of philosophy and autonomy of philosophy theses and illustrations of both in this introduction and in the chapters in this section to follow? The answer is at least twofold. First, a very well-known Christian philosopher recently noted that when scientists make claims that seem to conflict with biblical teaching and solid theology, with notable exceptions, including the biblical scholars and theologians who contribute to this volume, and I might add some in this class, um, Theologians and biblical scholars start ducking into foxholes, hoist the white flag of surrender, and trip over each other in the race to see who can be the first to come up with a revision of biblical teachings that placates the scientists. Thus, the dialogue between science and theology or biblical exegesis is really a monologue 
with the theologians asking scientists what the latest discoveries allow them to teach. Homosexuality is caused by our DNA? No problem. The Bible doesn't teach the immorality of homosexuality anyway. We've misread it for 2,000 years. 4,000 years, maybe. Um, neuroscience shows there is no soul? No problem. Dualism in the soul or Greek idea is not found in the Bible, which is more Hebraic and holistic. A completely materialistic story of evolution is adequate to explain the origin and development of all life? No problem. After all, the Bible isn't a science text. Adam and Eve, do we really need them literally to be historical figures? No. And on and on it goes. Lest you think I exaggerate, listen to the views of the late theologian Arthur Peacock. There is a strong prima facie case for re-examining the claimed cognitive content of Christian theology in the light of the new knowledge derivable from the scientists. sciences. Whoa. If such an exercise is not continually undertaken, theology will operate in a cultural ghetto quite cut off from most of those in Western cultures who have good grounds for thinking that science describes what is going on in the processes of the world at all times. The turbulent history of the relation of science and theology bears witness to the impossibility of theology seeking a peaceful haven protected from the sciences of its times if it is going to be believable. So, you know, just quit. Wow, what a robust and vibrant confidence in the Bible. The truth is when Peacock, Giberson, and others make statements like this, for the statements to be credible, they need to be expressed expressions of a fairly thorough acquaintance with epistemology. How do you know things? After all, if one is going to claim that one field, science, is cognitively superior to another field, biblical studies or theology, one should have a pretty good idea of what knowledge is and how one can tell the difference between weakly and strongly justified beliefs. This leads me to my second observation about the relevance of the authority and autonomy thesis for this book. Scientists are usually ill-equipped to draw metaphysical, epistemological, or moral conclusions from scientific data. And the reason is that drawing those conclusions is largely a philosophical matter, as I've tried to illustrate above. If this is correct, then an issue arises. If some alleged scientific discovery seems to contradict a time-tested understanding of the Bible, and if it contradicts historically embraced and epistemically justified theological models, then why jump immediately to a revisionist view of the Bible and theology? Instead, folks like those involved in Biologa should slow down, take a deep breath, and form integrative teams with philosophers, theologians, and scientists who can present rigorous defenses of the traditional, I think that's supposed to be traditional, Christian positions. This approach is especially incumbent on scientists when they realize that, one, formulating models of things like the existence of Adam and Eve or the adequacy of naturalistic mechanisms to explain life and its diversity is an integrative affair that should include philosophers and theologians who are able to defend the traditional view. And two, there is at least a small, or large, but robust group of significant intellectually rigorous scientists, philosophers, and theologians who are quite com competent to defend the traditional view. Thus, such a group exists, though it is far from small, and it is the intel intelligent design movement. If these two admonitions are followed, then it will become evident that philosophy, especially the authority and autonomy theses, are, are at the very heart of the issues. In one way or another, all the chapters in this section illustrate the centrality of philosophical issues in the intelligent design theistic evolution debate. And after reading these chapters, I believe it will become clear that the crucial philosophical issues and arguments to follow show beyond a reasonable doubt that intelligent design theory is far more reasonable than theistic evolution. Now, that's the chapter with a few elisions. Uh, which I hope haven't changed significantly what he has to say. Uh, my own take on this is that I approach Moreland's chapter with some skepticism. One of the advances of science was to say that observation trump theory. Um, uh, do we really need to go back to the Middle Ages? I don't think so. Uh, and I particularly have in mind uh, the the fact that at first there were four substances and then a 
fifth substance, the quintessence, which uh, of which the stars were made of. Um, and the moon was thought to be a star, too. And uh, it's a place where philosophy really didn't do well without looking at how the universe operates. And so from a, from a standpoint of that, I think that science is important. Now, a problem with Moreland's approach is that one can sometimes see easy, subjective defeaters for his arguments. Now, I'm not saying they're objective defeaters. They may not be very good, but if you're listening to the other side, you can tell that his arguments will, at bare minimum, fall on deaf ears. Life does not have to be material. Well, show me an actual example. Unless you can show angels, it's not going to help you much. I know brains. I don't know souls. Um, of course scientists are the most qualified people to define science. They do it all the time. These other people they don't know. Of course, what these people who, who say that forget is that philosophers of science actually know quite a bit of science. Um, to be precise, Steve Meyer and Paul Nelson are philosophers of science. Philosophers argue about words. Scientists argue about reality. Those are the kind of things you're going to get, and I don't know that you can get through them by just saying, well, philosophy is more important than science, without demonstrating it some way. Although, to be fair, if a scientist argues for an anti-realist, positivist, instrumentalist interpretation of science, such as Stephen Hawking does, he effectively surrenders that last argument. What do you mean they're talking about reality? They're talking about what seems to work, not reality. Positivism, in fact, died some time ago as a scientific philosophy because it didn't work. Moreland, I think, makes some important points. The philosophy of science asks questions that science itself cannot answer. You can't test everything that is true. And I think there is more to life than science. History is probably the best example I can give you. If you want to know what happened at the Battle of Waterloo, you don't assemble however many thousand French troops and however many thousand English and German troops and f make them fight each other and see what happens. That's not the way to settle it. The way to settle it is by finding out from eyewitnesses what actually happened. There is more to life than science. History is not really, strictly speaking, science. Even if one makes a case that is that is it lies within the limits of science, there are, there are things going on that science won't help you. But I do think and this is one of the few chapters that I'll make some serious criticism. I think he has a diagnosis mostly wrong. The problem with much of modern science is not actually that it takes science over philosophy. What it is actually is that it starts with a wrong theology. It then gives a wrong philosophy from that theology. You know, so I don't believe in God or God won't interfere with the universe or something like that. And then it interprets science in the light of that theology and that philosophy. And I would say that this was actually prophesied in Second Peter 3. And I think he has a cure partly wrong. The problem should be attacked on philosophical and theological grounds, uh, but the science position is intended to be impregnable on those grounds. And therefore, the primary attack has to be on scientific grounds as those are the only grounds that will be listened to. One can argue that they shouldn't be the only grounds that should be listened to. Um, but if you do so without involving science, if you can't show that it actually makes a difference, it's not going to be persuasive. Thus, that is, we have to show the divergence between what the scientist, scientific establishment, current scientific establishment anyway, expects and what the facts show. And we have to do it fairly without controlling the outcome. If we do it unfairly, we have proven that we're better manipulators than they are. We haven't proven that we're closer to the truth. The model, I think, is Elijah. You know, two altars. You try yours. We'll try mine. We'll see which God works. 
Sometimes argument is enough, but sometimes demonstration is, in fact, more helpful, and that's essentially a scientific approach. To be fair to Moreland, he is actually doing this, whether he acknowledges it in this chapter or not. Um, remember, that's why the book of which he is the first editor starts with science and not with philosophy. If you could do it all with philosophy, you wouldn't need science. Science itself, in fact, points away from atheism. Theistic evolution, in fact, hangs on to a science that is being discredited by evidence for intelligent design. If I can put it this way, one of the major advances of philosophy was the recognition that God could make the world any way he wanted to, and so that if you wanted to understand the actual universe, the one we live in, one had to observe it accurately. But when one insists on methodological naturalism, one is not observing the universe, but rather imposing a philosophical view on the universe. Don't forget, the universe looks designed, and that's acknowledged by all parties, including Dawkins, multiple places. Here, good science, in fact, the universe looks designed and there's no good explanation for, him, for, for it from the other side, trumps bad philosophy masquerading as science. There must not be a God, therefore there must not be uh, any evidence for God, and therefore science must be done as if there's no evidence for God. Can good science trump good philosophy? Uh, you know, this is an argument with does bad science, uh, does good philosophy trumps bad science? I'm making a case that it does. Does good science trump bad philosophy? Yes. Uh, does good philosophy trump bad science? Probably. But what about good science and good philosophy? Well, in my opinion, the two cannot be in conflict. Um, good science knows its limitations. It's not going to claim more than what it can prove. And good philosophy incorporates good science. And so you really can't have a conflict if you've done the if you've done both of them right. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Nobody's commenting. Okay, Ariel, go ahead. Not not quite ready for what I'm going to say, but uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, something could be learned from the way theology, which we could broadly interpret as a philosophy to a certain extent, uh, has repeatedly capitulated to science. And uh, this has caused, I think, uh, success of, of science to a certain extent. When, when uh, Newtonian mechanics came in, they had to give up a lot of ideas, theological ideas. And then when uh, absolute mechanism came in, uh, uh, theologians adopted that, and they had to give that up uh, because of quantum mechanics and so on. Uh, theology has lost its reputation in front of science. Uh, I don't know that... Uh, it has really a sound reason for doing that, but it's uh, the facts of science tend to uh, impress us more than the facts of that are less empirical that we often use, like consciousness and uh, emotions and so on. Uh, uh, and so uh, it seems to me part of the error here is that we're fascinated with facts of science because they're so obvious, so simple, and they tend to dominate uh, 
what our minds uh, consider valid. Uh, but that's a, a limiting factor that may not be realistic. And so I think part of the uh, argument here needs to be that uh, don't stick to uh, that which is obvious because you don't know how much there is that is not obvious. In other words, a little information is pretty bad when you try to broad, uh, draw broad conclusions. Be careful and uh, be aware of the limitations of your information. What? Six blind men and the elephant, yes. 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 Well, I think there's something that's interesting because virtually no one really complains about... Uh, the philosophy of science being important and the question of whether there's a demarcation <coughs> because if you're going to say science is authoritative, non-science is not or science is more authoritative than non-science, however you want to put that uh, uh, if you're going to say that then you need to be able to say well what is science and that's clearly not a question that's that can be settled by empirical investigation. And so uh, most of the time, the truth of the matter is the philosophy of science people pretty much have the field to themselves. Um, the only difference, I think, is that uh, philosophy of science often uh, includes the history of science. And you might say that the history of science is quasi-scientific data. That is to say, it involves uh, what we know about how science has behaved in the past, and that therefore, if you're trying to answer a question of how does science work, well, the best way to find out is probably to see how science has worked in the past. Yes. Yes. Refer back to our book, A Space Age Interpretation of the Bible, and predominantly lingu linguistics, I, what comes to mind uh, is Alfred North Whitehead's, uh, his process theology. Um, I can elaborate on that when I was working with, uh, with my work. Uh, it, Lee and I were living for several years in different cities, and so I was all alone with this work. And uh, it occurred to me about right off agree it's totally philosophical of course it's, it's philosophical theological you can't you can't uh, I was very much involved in Kundalini and Raja Yoga and it's, it's all the same but what comes to mind is um, and I'm a bit enamored of uh, Whitehead so I think I'm going to let Lee if you want to elaborate on like we do on the shows but we need here to interject as far as I'm concerned in my expertise, this particular work, something said about process theology here. Well, I won't jump right into process theology, although I will point out that it's the currently used term for what the book calls theistic evolution. Uh, and it's a more accurate term because actually theistic evolution to the average conservative Christian is a pejorative term. Since evolution compels one to be atheistic, obviously theistic evolution is an oxymoron. You can't believe in evolution and believe in God at the same time. This view holds. Uh, so if you, instead of calling it theistic evolution, you call it process theology, and say that God creates incrementally over time and not just all at once and then twiddles his thumbs for the rest of eternity. Uh, theistic evolution 
is believable and, and is not inconsistent with belief in God. The question simply becomes, how did God choose to create? Did he choose to create all at once in one week or six literal days and then do nothing for the rest of eternity? Or has he been in the business of creating all along? And using ourselves by analogy, of course, if we had eternal life, we'd have to do something to keep from being bored to death. And presumably, we would continuously create, uh, not do all of creation at once, and then never do anything after that, except perhaps kind of supervise or occasionally intrude supernaturally into the order and suspend it. But that, that kind of an argument is not scientific, it is philosophical. And I agree with you entirely and with Morrison part of the, the part, part of the time that uh, the argument for theistic evolution can be made both from science and the Bible. Uh, I'll just talk about how it can be made from science right now. In fact, I will argue that if a person is scientifically literate and believes that God created the universe, then one must believe in theistic evolution because the cosmos clearly evolved in an evolutionary way, is still evolving, and will continue to evolve in an evolutionary way. And all you need to prove it is a camera and a telescope because time takes a finite interval. I mean, light takes a finite interval of time to get to us. And light from distant objects, which seem to be coming to us now at the same time, have originated from events that occurred at different times. So really, when you look at the heavens with a telescope or photograph it with a camera, what you're doing is photographing the history of creation from, say, the Big Bang down to the present. And if you do that, what you see is nebula condensing into clusters of galaxies, galaxies condensing into stars, stars collecting or uh, debris orbiting around them that are planets. And in this history, stars are born, they die. The whole thing is incremental and extends over very long periods of time. If you believe Wilson and Penzias, maybe as much as 13, 7 tenths billion years, it's been evolving. So if one believes in God and one believes in modern astronomy, it seems to me you have to believe that there is such a thing as theistic evolution, and it is not an oxymoron. The real question becomes, does that also apply to biological evolution? Did it happen at one time, in one week, or has it been happening? And you have evidence both ways. If you go to microbiology, where organisms turn over very, very fast, you can see evolution occurring from one year to the next, for example. The flu virus requires new inoculations. It becomes immune to the old ones. Well, you say that's adaptation within a species. It's not really evolution. If you read about uh, the great plague that wiped out a third of Europe in a few decades, and you read something like Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year, why you find that it started out as a disease transmitted by rats that caused swelling of the lymph glands, and it evolved over the course of wiping out a third of Europe into a disease that was transmitted by contagion from person to person, showed no signs so the person could be talking and seemingly be perfectly well and feel well and suddenly kill, kill over and die within minutes from pneumonic plague rather than bubonic plague. Mm -hmm. And of course, quite recently, we've seen the AIDS virus emerge 
from a disease that was in the brain of monkeys, apparently, and transferred to humans who ate the brains of monkeys. And while it didn't seem to bother the monkeys very much, it kills humans very quickly. And it spread so rapidly in our own generation that whole nations like Botswana were threatened with going out of business because of it. So at the microbiological level, you can observe evolution occurring in the same way that you observe it in the cosmos. At the macro level, ourselves, it's debatable. And here the big question becomes the Bible. So I would say there are two questions here, uh, Dr. Geem, that need to be focused from all that you've covered today. One question is, what is the right way to deal with the relation of religion to science that's based on the Bible? Should we reinterpret scientific data that claim to be well established in order to fit our interpretation of the Bible? Or should we examine our interpretation of the Bible and try to accommodate it to what science is firmly established and that's beyond question? such as the evolution of the cosmos, for example, uh, at least is my take. Yeah. Well, I'll say a couple of things to that. One of them is that uh, what you've outlined uh, in terms of the cosmic changes that are taking place are uh, well within the range of young life creationism. Um mm -hmm they are not necessarily in the range of young uh, universe creationism, and that I think that there's an important distinction between those two. I would say, I, although I don't favor that, I am cautious about uh, uh, being too dogmatic about that that couldn't happen because I've seen other... Um, other supposedly scientific arguments collapse. So uh, while I would say the evidence for an old universe is pretty strong and in fact it convinces me uh, at this point, I'm, I'm not willing to say that I absolutely have to be right and I have to be open to the possibility of something else coming along that surprises us in uh, in our attempts to put the universe together. Um, those would be the two comments I would say. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, the, the question of how long life has been here, that's a question we've dealt with a lot. Uh, and uh, I don't want to go over all of those in the next five minutes or so. But I'm going to turn the floor over to Jack, and then there was a hand way back there. And then, uh, Ariel, I think you It's been interesting for me, uh, having been at this for a while from the science side, is there's one topic that has not evolved. That is the questions that people who question the philosophy of science are asking. You can go back millennia and pick up exactly the same stuff conceptually. So where has it taken us? Asking unanswerable questions over and over and over again and claiming insight that some would use to put exp an experimental approach to questions that are based in nature and natural process into a box without seeing how it fits into the box. And uh, if, you, if you then try to pile on our understanding of the brain and what's going on there, and you should be able to define the soul some way by understanding the brain. We've been, At least we've been limits on the soul. We've been down the road that the mind is separate from the brain as an entity. That's a philosophical position that is unsupportable pragmatically. 
there's actually a, a um, sort of mathematical scientific argument for the brain not being uh, identical to the mind and vice versa. Well, I, of course, being a neuroscientist, I've been in and out of that a lot, but I, I keep wanting to ask a question. What aspect of the mind would not have to be traceable back to the brain? Yes. Um, well, prob probably, at least for me, the, the, there would be two things. One of them would be memory, and the other one would be understanding. Of course. But those are founded in mental processes. Well, but they're not necessarily founded in physical processes, and that's where uh, the brain, well, as, well, is, as is being used would, here, you, the you, brain is considered to be physical. You would have to say not founded because the complexity is such that we haven't found a root that's convincing. Well, it's not just that we haven't found a root, and that's this is why, for me, the argument is so important, is that, uh, for example, it turns out that you can stimulate people's brains and you can get memories out of them. And the memories are incredibly detailed. They can be, uh, t uh, say that they, they, ha they have awareness that, this, that, that this isn't happening right now, so there, there's, there's, the, uh, there's a certain amount of third-person observation to their memory. Uh, so you're not, you're not just simply putting them back in to experience it. Uh, there's, there's more to it than that. But even if that was all there was to it, you can have them reading books and remember what the book said. Um, which means that uh, and the stuff that they were not aware of then, they are not aware of now. But the stuff that they were aware of then, they are aware of now. And I'm having trouble figuring out where, you, where the hard drive is to store all that stuff. You, you put it very well. There is a hard drive. <laughs> One thing we do know is if the, if the hard drive crashes, the mind is non-existent. Yes. But, as, uh, as a usable entity. Yeah. But see, the, the philosophical question, and this is an important one, is, is the mind more like a computer or is the mind more like a radio receiver? You see, if you have a radio receiver, you can smash it and there will be no... Uh, no programming coming in. You won't be able to hear anything. On the other hand, the programming is still there. As witness, you can get another radio and tune it to the exact same frequency well, and suddenly the, you've got it. The programming is still there unless you take the philosophical position that characterizes philosophical naturalism. Because that programming has to be outside of... <coughs> Yeah. Natural processes. But, but what I'm saying is that the, that the argument that the brain is exactly the mind uh, is not, uh, not one that um, will, will not allow for anything outside of... Uh, the, the brain has to be a computer at that point. It cannot be a receiver. It can be both. But if it is both, I mean, and I'm not saying that, of course, it's purely a receiver, but I'm saying that it is also a, um, there, there's, there's evidence to argue for the idea that it is more than a computer, that it uh, has some receiving capacity. Well, to totally agree. And, and, and if that's the case, then there's something out there beyond oh, yes. the, the, uh, the, re the, reception, the receptor itself. And you're getting exactly to where I think the point is. Uh, the mind does exist. It depends on the brain for its individual functioning. Right. And its interaction and, with humanity, uh, and uh, with, the, with, the, with you know, what we call the material world. I fully believe in the ability, and I can't demonstrate this, 
the ability to communicate with our maker. And I do believe that that could be a physical process. Where or, the brain, could is, involve the a brain is open process. to a kind of input that yeah. we don't understand. Yeah. But I, I'm simply saying trying to separate the two. Yeah. But well, what I'm saying is if, if, you try to, if you try to do some kind of, you know, how many bits of information do you have to have, um, I think that it overwhelms the ability of the brain as a computer type, even a very fancy de delocalized uh, non uh, non CPU based computer. Uh, I think it still overwhelms the ability to memorize all that stuff. And the fact of the matter is that at least in most normal people, it does in fact have that kind of capacity. The other, the other thing is that that is um, that is interesting is, and, and quantum computing may be able to get around this, but in that case, we're now talking about a process that is not strictly speaking mechanical. It, it, it may be mathematical, but it's not mechanical. Yes, and this is an interesting new area. I'm, I'm simply saying, uh, to add to it, the, the perspective that I and a number of my Christian neuroscientists share is that the, the mind of a human, which is dependent on the brain of the human, is what distinguishes us from all other organisms. But the interesting thing is, what I'm arguing is that there are actually experimental uh, differences between the two theories that, that in principle could be tested for. You uh, could find you're, out you're how talking much about quantum, quantum mechanics versus straightforward physiology. Well, I'm, uh, yeah, but I'm also talking about straightforward physiology and the need for some kind, I mean, if nothing else, there's got to be uh, our memories have. If if they're if they're limited to um, to the physical, then there has to be some specific switches that turn one way or another. And if you're going to be able to read a book fifty years later, that means that we all have photographic memory. We just aren't able to access it most of the time. And it means that every single word of every single page, perhaps we uh, digest them so fast and, and uh, you know that we don't actually see letters. Uh, that we that we that that what gets registered as words, but you're still going to have to put them somewhere. You're going to have to have a you know at minimum you you run out of atoms sooner or later. And I think that the that the data storage. Re requirement is so great that you're not going to be able to put them all into a physical brain. But yeah, of course, uh, I have yet to hear a well-founded estimate of what the capacity of the brain is. When you have <laughs> what billions of neurons in the brain, right, interconnected with each other a thousand times each neuron getting input from at least a thousand other neurons, when you start looking at that capacity, you're approaching infinity. Uh, you're not approaching infinity fast enough, I don't think. Oh. The, 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 the terabytes of information that you're going to have to keep inside is may, may dwarf... No, uh, I'm, I'm totally comfortable with the information you're, you're understanding coming from outside you. We, our brain just gives us a way to receive that and yeah. process it. Yeah, and I, 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 nothing I say is intended to say yeah. that the brain, anyway. at, at, at present life, is that the brain is not essential. What, that if, what if somebody say, cuts yeah. off your head, your memories will cease in 15 seconds, guaranteed. <laughs> well, your ability to bear, uh, be aware of whether or not they cease is ceases instantaneously. <laughs> Not quite. The heads no, actually I know, I, are... I know what you mean. The pra but head, for practical but, uh, purposes, yes. The way of expressing it is yeah. gone. No, that, we're, to me, we're engaging in the kind of dialogue that at least science has not been limited by because science has moved ahead where the underlying philosophy, I don't see anything really new 
from what you could have you could have had the discussion with less information, the same discussion millennia ago, or at least centuries ago. Yes, and I agree with you. I think that I think that so, philosophy without science went very, very slowly and haltingly until we started looking at the universe. And that's why I say, mm -hmm. when I read his thesis, I thought, hmm. But then as I'm listening to it more, I think I'm hearing where he's coming from. And although I would change a few things, I think that, um, that his points are not all that bad. Uh, my, la my last statement, to me, uh, the underlying principles that a philosophical naturalism embraces is the reason why we haven't gotten, gotten anywhere. The refusal to look outside of your own brain, to look for input that your brain is set up to use, is why we're on the same points yeah. for at least centuries. Yeah. Well, we have a comment way back there. I don't know if I can get the mic back to him, her or not, but... Uh I took a class from Dr. Harding, who founded the School of Public Health called Philosophy of Health. He asked the class one day, are you a body or do you have a body? That took about a half hour to discuss. <laughs> and parallel thought would be, are you in your most focused part a brain or do you have a brain? Yes. Um. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a difficult question to answer. We're starting to get some glimmers of how to possibly answer it. But you're exactly right. Uh, Dr. Harding also said um, that um, the stomach's function is from its cells to secrete things like hydrochloric acid. And the function of physical brain cells is to secrete thought through the electrochemical biological complex that makes thought and there is no soul or spirit that's going to leave the body when you die and go someplace else um, that what makes the humans above all other animals and we are in the animal kingdom <laughs> unless we want to say there's the fourth human kingdom is that we do have this capacity for relating to God, relating to people, making moral decisions, and moral includes both moral and immoral. I can choose to do something good or I can choose to do something evil, and those are both moral choices in the broad sense of the word. But they are not dependent on the function of a spirit inside me. God is spirit. Angels, and he is divine spirit. Angels are spirit beings rather than human beings, though they can take human form. But we are not spirits. We are humans with brains that were created in the image of God. Our brains have the capacity to make spiritual, moral choices. Because we're created in the image of God, we have eyes, and that means that God can see. We have ears created in his image. This implies that he can hear us. We have mouths. This implies he wants to speak to us. But we do not require souls or spirits inside of us, separate from us in order to be fully human because our human brains are far higher than uh, the, the materialist or evolutionist would give it credit for. <laughs>
Yes. Uh, no, it's interesting because we uh, we looked at some of the evidence, and particularly in quantum mechanics, suggesting that the real world is not made of particles that bump against each other and send out fields. Um, that the the really real world, the one that you can actually test, behaves like it was created by a mathematician to obey mathematical rules that some of which are coextensive with mechanical rules and some of which are not. And when when you realize that that's the way the real world works, you realize that we shouldn't be surprised if we can do more than what you would expect from a atoms bumping together. Uh, now that doesn't mean I, I think that you know the idea of a soul that floats off from the body and is conscious and is able to do all kinds of stuff is a little more poorly supported and particularly um, uh, and particularly the idea that the soul must always be conscious is flat out refuted by most of us every night. There are times in our experience where we simply become unconscious. And, uh, I mean, there are dreams. And if you want to, you can use them as evidence. Uh, but some of us will sleep like a log for eight hours and wake up and say, whoa, where did the time go? Um, at least some nights. And what that means is that... Uh, that the soul is not eternally conscious because we can demonstrate that. That's empirical evidence, if you like. On the other hand, exactly how the soul works, obviously it depends on the brain because you put somebody on an anesthesia and the person does not experience consciousness, and that's using a, what we would normally call a physical means. But exactly how that works, we don't know. And science can give us kind of boundaries around which to work with that, but is not going to answer the underlying questions easily at least, and maybe not at all. I think it's fair? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'd like to add a footnote to what I said about uh, interpreting the Bible properly so that it uh, fits or accords with established science. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Actually, the Bible itself tries to answer the question of how do you properly interpret the Bible. Uh, Paul, in writing to his protege Timothy in the, his second epistle, uh, the uh, second chapter in the 15th verse says, Study to show thyself approved, a workman unto God that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, what does he mean when he says to divide the word of truth? Obviously, there's only one thing he could mean there, that truth comes in two versions. There's literal truth, and there's symbolic or figurative truth. They both point to truths, but in different ways, literal truth lies right in the surface meaning of the words that are used. Symbolic truth uh, lies in a deeper meaning, spiritual or otherwise, that is pointed to by the words that are used but does not actually lie in the words themselves, which may actually tip you off that a deeper meaning is there by being self-contradictory or an oxymoron or puzzling or anomalous or whatever. And uh, when it comes to interpreting Revelation, for example, most of you are familiar, I think, with this book. Mm -hmm. seen the one called Revelation on the book of Revelation. Right. And in that, it has, makes a very interesting statement about the Bible. 
it says that uh, revelations that you can uh, that most of the Bible can be taken as literally explaining what it means, and therefore you should take the surface meaning of the words. But in the case of revelation, mostly you have to take it symbolically. And when it is talking about beasts with multiple heads or dragons, obviously it's not saying that there was a time when dragons existed or the beasts with seven heads existed. It's saying there is a deeper truth. Maybe it's the seven hills of Rome and it's talking about Rome or it's the seven churches that Revelation was sent to by John who wrote it. Or it's the number seven, which the Jews regard as sacred, and it's pointing to that. But anyway, this uh, document, which tells uh, Adventists how to interpret the Bible in their Sabbath study Mm -hmm. and has the approval of the conference, says that some of the Bible, Revelation in particular, should be taken mostly as symbolic Mm -hmm. and not as literal. And, of course, if Revelation can be taken that way, so can Genesis. That is to say, when it says that God created the heavens in one day between dawn and night, obviously that is not true. It might be symbolically true, but it's not astronomically true. The universe has evolved over time and is still evolving now. And... uh, even uh, the uh, parts of it that are mentioned in that account, the sun and the moon, didn't appear immediately. They appeared over time. So when it says, for example, that uh, humans were created in the first chapter at the end of creation, male and female, and when it says in the second chapter, that the male was created first, then animals, plants were created, then a deep sleep was put on the male, and a rib was taken and woman's created. Maybe we should take that not as two different accounts of one creation, but rather as a literal account in the first chapter and a symbolic account in the second. Uh, that's a possibility, uh, which I said we explore in our book. But uh, there are various ways we can do this, and I think we need to be aware of the need, as Paul said, and as he cautioned Timothy, to rightly divide the word of truth to know when the Bible is to be taken literally word for word and when it is to be taken as symbolically. We've talked in this seminar almost constantly about how science can be reinterpreted to figure, to fit with what might be a flawed interpretation of the Bible. I think we need to spend time, too, considering how the Bible should be interpreted properly to fit what science has established where it has established fact. I need to add one. No. May I? Please. We, we can probably do that um. Uh, at another time, I, time to go. I think if we time to go, I if we try to fix this today, we'll be here until five o'clock at least. Yeah. What five minutes on his? Uh, just want to mention last week, briefly we mentioned origin. Well, what he just said, origin, touches on that. The great teacher and Clement, but origin touches on the fact of this symbol symbolism, and he intuited. In yoga, we'd say it's the third eye consciousness, but he intuited a hierarchy of which his hexapla, we won't go into that to now, which you're aware of. So you're familiar with his, what he did with his hexapla. Yes, yeah. So Origen already touched on that long ago. Okay. I'm going to pass it back to uh, Ariel Roth and Will. Yeah. I'm just going to comment that uh, included in the equation, we must look at everything we can is data that's pretty hard to answer unless you do believe in the biblical account. And I'm speaking of uh, the geological data that's uh, hard to answer unless you uh, think in terms of an entirely different system than what is going on out there now. Out there we have 
a little accident here, a little accident there, and uh, supposedly this occurred for over billions of years, and we build up this uh, yeah. sequence, and you go out there and you look at this, and you find hundreds of thousands of square miles of things, continuous layers. Uh, it's a different game out there that is so obvious that it is not hard to believe in the Bible. This, well. Speaking of uh, literal versus figurative, um, that's an interesting view. I think also of where the Bible says that we are to let Scripture interpret itself and that when a symbol is used, you will always find a verse that will tell us literally what that symbol means, especially in Revelation. For, for example, it speaks of the great dragon, and then it tells us that dragon is the devil. And we're not supposed to be saying it's, oh, China or some such nonsense. I wonder if I could make a couple of suggestions to help uh, further the discussion process. The first suggestion would be that the mic not be given to anyone who has already made a comment until everyone else who wants to speak the first time has a chance. You want to, is that clear? I try to do that. When I see hands raised, I try to go around yeah, but, as fast as I can. Yeah, but uh, I think if we had that as a kind of a, a group agreement, that it would help so that everyone has a chance. Some people are a little more shy speaking up than others, and if there is a pause of a two or three seconds, it will give others a chance rather than going on to someone who's already talked once or twice. And secondly, I wonder if there could be some kind of a time limit given to uh, each discussion point made by the group as a whole. I'm not sure what that should be, two, three, four, five minutes, but I think consideration should be given so that we don't have, you know, two major lectures here rather than just yours. We will see what can be done about that, but... Uh, um. Well, uh, next week we're going to be talking about, about methodological naturalism. And uh, we'll be reading a chapter from, or pieces of a chapter, obviously, we can't read the whole chapter, from uh, two philosophers of science um, who have done a great deal of work in scientific work. Um, and uh, one of whom actually published a paper which got into the scientific literature before the uh, thought police stomped it out, um, which has since been published uh, in longer form and uh, uh, more thorough. And uh, I, I think that to withhold the name scientist from him is probably not fair. Um, and so you have a you have a scientist who is a philosopher of science at the same time, which I think is actually a good thing. Um, and in fact, I think most philosophers of science they do study philosophy, but they also do study science. And in fact, they study the history of science, which is sometimes more revealing than science itself. Um, but I'll have to say, I think that um, I think they were in for an interesting. Uh, set of discussions uh, both next week and the week after on methodological naturalism. So with that, you're welcome to come back and we'll talk about it next week.